Well, it's good to see your smiling faces here today in the house of the Lord. It's great to uh, realize that uh, I guess summer's coming to a close, and uh, there are some positive things that happen when that does occur. Uh, certainly, we know that uh, the weather becomes a little bit easier to breathe in, but it's great to have people come back at the conclusion of their vacations and their times away uh, to come back to the house of the Lord and renew fellowships and opportunities. So this morning, if you need a Bible, we'd be happy to put one in your hand. Just slip up your hand and uh, you'll be following along. We'll be in several different scriptures here this morning as we complete our series this summer of multiplying your life. This morning, we'll be talking about uh, multiplying your life through hope, having hope in the Lord. And so this morning, we're going to be doing that. Uh, Just a word of encouragement, if you are interested in that uh, men's thing, the sportsman's weekend, the sportsman's retreat, as it were. Um, let me just encourage you there. there there's no, nothing's going to be shot there. I, I like how they put these strange pictures on. It's the first, the, the brochure from the camp itself has fallow deer on it. I don't even know where you'd find fallow deer, deer in the world. Um, and, and there's no deer being shot. And there's no, the only thing being shot is a target, all right? And they, they have a picture of the guy. He's got his bow and arrow up there. And he's, he's shooting fish. Like, I'm looking for the barrel, you know? It's like, are you going to shoot fish in the barrel? Well, we don't shoot fish. And, you know, it's just... It's not that kind of a time. But if you, if you like um, fellowshipping with guys, uh, I'll be speaking twice. Friday night, Saturday morning, I've invited a friend who's actually, um, he's got a, a, a construction business, but on the side he has uh, a farm in uh, Pike County, Illinois. He does outfitting there. He's a Christian man who loves the Lord, and he'll be sharing some things about his time. He actually, he actually took a honeymoon to Africa. He, he was like 50 years old, married for the first time, and he found a girl that loves the outdoors, and they went hunting in Africa. So that was quite a, quite a time. So he's going to talk about that. He'll probably talk about how to find a girl who likes hunting. But um, <laughs> whatever it is, we'll be having a good time uh, there. So if you like to target practice, you want to bring something, you know, tomahawk or whatever to throw, that's fine. This morning we're going to talk about hope. I think of the songwriter, 1945, a man by the name of Norman Clayton wrote this hymn. He said, my hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he freely gives. Let's pray. God, we ask that this morning you'd be with us as we study your word. Help us, Father, today to gain a biblical perspective of hope and the fruit that it produces in our lives. Help us, Lord, to be encouraged today. Help us, Father, to understand that you want to use us and you want to bless us. And we give you thanks for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we think of hope, there is that aspect of expectation that is surrounded by a positive anticipation. If you were to take the reverse of hope, you would probably end up with a word that we know as dread. We would think of dread as anticipation of something that is unpleasant, maybe an unpleasant event. And we've all had things in our life that we've looked forward to with that which is a positive notion. And then we've also had things in life that we've looked at with great dread. And we've, we've circled the calendar and we look at the calendar and we think to ourselves, oh no, this day is drawing near. Well, this is all about hope as it's understood in a very positive setting. When we look at scripture, we see that hope is used by the Apostle Paul and others as being a very positive uh, reality that uh, really transcends the whole aspect of wishful thinking. Hope is a certainty if you look at the writings of someone like the Apostle Paul. And as we'll see in the passage that we're going to look at this morning, hope really begins a chain reaction that emboldens the believer uh, to live in a particular way that is filled with all types of blessings. And I'll, I'll talk about that more in a moment. But what exactly is hope? As I've mentioned in the past, it's not a wishy-washy kind of unsure optimism. Uh, the modern idea of hope today is to wish for, but really not expect necessarily, Uh, the fulfillment of what we're wishing for. There's a great desire there, but there's really no assurance that you're going to see that realized. In Scripture, 
when we look at even the Hebrew and the Greek words in Scripture that are translating the word hope, we're seeing with the biblical usage an indication of certainty. Hope in the Scripture means a strong and a confident expectation. And though that's archaic today in modern times, hope really is akin to trust and confidence and having that confident expectation. Hope might refer to the activity of hoping or the object hope for, the content of our hope. But by its very nature, hope does stress a couple of things. One is the future aspect, the futuristic aspect of hope. There's always looking forward to something. We're anticipating something that's in the distance a little bit. And we're looking at that and we're saying, that's where our hope is. It also comes with the aspect of invisibility. We can't see exactly the realization of this. We can't pin it right down. And so when we look at things that we can't see, we're reminded that, that hope gives us an expectation that biblically is a reality, and we look forward with great anticipation to what is yet ahead. In Romans chapter 8, there's a passage there as we look at Romans 8, 24, and 25, and let me just read this for you this morning. He says, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is already seen, or what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. You see the aspect of certainty there? Paul is saying, we're waiting eagerly for the realization of that object, the object that is hoped for. My salvation is a reality. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. There are things that I do not see. I never saw the imputation of righteousness, have you? I've never seen the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God, have you? I've never seen certain aspects of my salvation, God adding that righteousness to my account, or my co-union with Christ. I've never seen all of those things, but it's still a reality for me. And I eagerly await the culmination of my salvation, when it's all brought together and I'm there in the presence of the Lord. Now, before I go much further, let me just point this out. Our God is a God who gives hope. He is very concerned about his followers and he always wants his people to have hope. Hope is something that is absolutely essential for us. Think of this picture of this man with the cats. Obviously, there's been a flood there, and obviously, he saved these kittens' lives. And they have, without a doubt, an element of hope. If I'm that cat, I'm praying that he does not slip. But I have reason to be optimistic if I'm that cat. There was a study done back in the 1950s. I've read this all from a lot of different uh, writers and you can find it easily on the internet. But back in the 1950s, there was a, a test that was done by a scientist. Uh, his name was, uh, I think, uh, Hannibal Richter. No, his name was Kurt Richter, but you get the idea. And, and some of the stories that, are, that describe this are very um, animal-friendly and some are not. So I'll give you the animal-friendly version. So back in 1957, he was trying to do a study on positive reinforcement. And so he took a basically a big glass acrylic um, cylinder and he filled it with water and he put rats in it. it it's a shame to be a rat. Um, I don't know what they did to deserve this, but he put him in there and he wanted to see how long they could swim. And there is absolutely no way that they can climb out. And so all they're doing is doing what, doggy paddle. Is it rat paddle? I guess a rat paddle. And so they're doing the rat paddle thing and he's waiting to see. And, and about the time they're drowning, <gasps> they're starting to go under the water. He reaches down and he pulls them out. And he times it, and he says, oh, okay, they lasted three minutes. 
He takes a second group, and he takes them, and he lets them swim for a couple of minutes, and he takes them out, and he holds them for a while, and then he puts them back in for another couple of minutes. The next day, he takes that second group of rats, and he places them back in that cylinder, but this time, he doesn't take them out. He wants to see how long they'll swim, and they swam for hours. His deduction was, and yes, of course, he fished them out. They didn't die. His, his conclusion was that these rats in the second group, because he had rescued them out, they were awaiting rescue, and so they swam much, much, much longer. Why? Because they had hope. They were like those kittens in that, that basin. They were full of hope. You and I are wired so as to have hope. In, in fact, life as we understand it should be all about possessing hope as Christians. God is a God of hope. Take your Bibles and go back with me. I want to show you, as we think of hope and, and, we, and the fruit that it produces in the life of the believer, I want you to see that the Christian's hope is well-founded. And as a matter of example, I want to go back to Genesis chapter 7 and show you that Noah was a man who God gave hope to. In Genesis chapter 6, God approached Noah he was a righteous man living in a horrible time. There is so much sin and wickedness. The Bible describes the days of Noah. All the way into the New Testament, God is still describing the days of Noah. And when you come to Noah, you find in chapter 6, God approaches him and explains to him that he's going to flood the world. At this point in time, Noah has never even lived through a rainy day. And God says, you need to start building an ark. Now, an ark's really not a ship, okay? There's no motor. There's no sail. It's not going anywhere. It's just a place to hide out for a while. But Noah, because you're righteous, you and your family are going to be saved from the destruction of the world. In chapter 7, the Lord comes to Noah and he says, enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I've seen to be righteous before me in this time. And so God said to Noah, what's going to happen is I'm going to also save all the critters. And so all the critters were supposed to get on the ark, and there they are coming two by two in a very orderly fashion. Noah, his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives, they all entered the ark in verse 7, and the water is going to be coming forth. Wow. Wow. They all get on, and the Bible says the flood came upon the earth in verse 17 for 40 days. Water increased, lifted up the ark, started to float. Water prevailed and increased greatly. The ark floated on the surface. The water prevailed more and more on the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere are uh, under the heavens are covered by water. In fact, the Bible tells us later on that I covered the entire earth with water. There are people who say that, well, no, this was a regional flood only. No, it wasn't. It was a universal flood. It flooded everywhere, and it came to the point where even the tips of the mountains are flooded. They're all underwater. God says that what I did was I allowed for uh, these fountains of the deep to come rushing up. So God breaks open the earth and he allows the water to come rushing up. At the same time, he allows this perhaps a canopy that was over the earth because there wasn't any rain, but God would, would allow the, the moisture to come upon the earth. He allows that to break. The water comes out of the earth. I can imagine only this, that it rained harder than you and I have ever seen. In only a few days, we have mass destruction in our country, don't we, when it rains like that? But this is going to go on for 40 days and 40 nights, never being a break. Can you imagine that? Now Noah's gotten done all this building. And now he's going to put all these animals on the ark. And all these animals get on the ark. And I'm imagining that this was a terrible time for Noah. You talk about being depressed. 
The Bible says in the last verse of chapter 7 that after the 40 days and 40 nights are over and the boat is free floating, and it's not again that that you can put it in gear and let's go explore anything. You're just a cork bobbing up and down. The Bible says that it went on for 150 days. 150 days. Now you can imagine being on that ship with all those animals for 150 days. I remember a documentary program that talked about the, one of the biggest cruise ships that were ever built. And they took you in the documentary down to the lowest hold in the ship. That's where all the garbage goes. You know how those cruise lines all have those huge buffets? How many have been on a cruise? Oh, most of you have. How many have not? All right, we're together. I've never been on a cruise. But I, I've always wondered whether it was on a cruise ship or on a buffet line at the local restaurant, what they did with all that old food. Well, I'm sure they fed it to all those animals that were on there, right? But could you imagine these animals that are eating and also, mm-hmm, where is all that stuff going? Where, where is all? I like to eat chicken, but I don't like the smell what it leaves behind. Have you ever lived near a chicken farm? I've lived at a, by a chicken farm. I remember driving past that chicken farm. I'm telling you what, you get retina burn going past a chicken farm. I mean, it's like ammonia. It is the strongest odor there is. Nice little buck, 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 buck. Oh, no. Oh, no. I want to tell you, that's some of the worst smelling stuff ever. And I can only imagine uh, that all of those animals had to have their nose plugged with one of those little clothespins. Uh, because it was terrible, the smell and the odor in that ark. If I'm Noah, I need a massive dose of hope, don't you? I mean, I'm thinking to myself, when is this going to be over, Lord? Uh, when are you going to open those holes back up and suck this water off of the earth? And so Noah started to send out birds. He sent out a raven, the Bible says, and the raven in chapter 8 uh, of Genesis flew around and uh, came back. He had nothing to say. And then the, the dove went out, and the dove flew around for a while, and the dove came back. And then one day he sent the dove out, and the dove came back, and it had an olive branch in its mouth. And he waited seven more days, and the, olive, or the, uh, the, the dove went flying out, and the dove never came back. Listen, I didn't ever come back too. I'd have had enough, wouldn't you? I can just imagine what it was like when they finally opened the doors to the ark and everybody could run off. Whoa, let's get out of here. I mean, if anybody lit a match, that place would have gone up, boom. There's Noah, he needs some help. Now, when the water all subsided, can you imagine how gross it looked down on the earth? There was probably bloated corpses of animals and dinosaurs and things rotting can you imagine what the water would have done to all the trees you can't submerge plants for three months and have them looking good i mean this is disgusting and god comes to old noah here and noah is 600 years old at this point he comes to him in chapter 9 and he says over there in verse uh, 8 and 9, he says, My covenant is with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you. Uh, the birds and the cattle and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, every beast of the earth, I establish my covenant with you. And so even the animals, this is the only place in the Bible where there's a covenant and it also extends from man clear on down to the animals. But they could all know this, that he says in verse 13, I set my bow in the cloud. It'll be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. After that time, that horrible event, every time Noah would see a rainbow in the sky. Literally, it's in the Hebrew, bow of war. And that's what God is saying. Every time you see my bow of war, know this, I'll never do that again. And so there was always hope. You see, Noah had gone from never experiencing a drop of rain on the face of the earth to all of a sudden this enormous cataclysmic event. And I wondered in his mind if he thought to himself, I wonder if this could happen again. God says, no, it'll never happen again. It's done. God gives Noah and he gives all of us something to hope for. Gives us hope, the future. 
If you take your Bibles and you go over to Romans chapter 4, I want to show you another example of hope. This is in the person of Abraham. And going back to these Old Testament examples are wonderful from our perspective because we can look at them and we can see the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God is enormously important. When Abraham placed his faith in God, he was placing his faith in God and he was basing it on many of the promises that God had made. In Romans chapter four and verse 22, it says, therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. What was? His faith. And we see the faith of Abraham as being something quite real. And his faith then is reckoned to him or counted as righteousness. He applies then the righteousness of God. It becomes available to him because of the instrument of faith. So the faith that he has is absolutely amazing. In verse 21, we find that he was fully convinced, fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. That's Romans chapter 4 and verse 21. And so this is what's in the heart of Abraham. Abraham had come to the point where he believed God. And one of the things that you'll see is a linking between faith and hope. And oftentimes the third is love, faith, hope, and love. You see that trifecta working together. But notice with me in verse 18, in hope, he says, against hope, he believed. In hope, against hope, he believed. When he says against hope, he is talking there from an ordinary human standpoint, there doesn't seem to be any hope. Like Noah was old, Abraham is also old. And when God comes to Abraham and Sarah and he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation and your descendants are going to be abundant, there was no reason for earthly hope. When there's absolutely no chance, a zero chance of something coming to pass, there is not much hope. They say that the motivation behind people that play the lottery is hope. They hope that there will be some chance that they will be able to win millions of dollars and quit their rotten day job and live a certain life that they only can dream of. If there was a 0% chance of winning, they wouldn't play. But if there's a tenth of a tenth of a percent of winning, they would play for not the statistical advantage because there is none, but they would play because there is still hope. Abraham's looking at this and saying, I don't think there's any hope of Sarah having a child. The problem is for Abraham, he was looking at it from a human perspective. When we think of biblical hope, Biblical hope is never based on what's possible with us as human beings. Biblical hope looks away from man and it looks to the promises of God. And when it does, it becomes the full assurance of hope. When I think of the full assurance of hope, what I'm talking about there is Hebrews 6.11 that talks about that full assurance that we can have. That full assurance of hope is so important. And so when I think of biblical hope, I'm thinking not of that which is wishy-washy, but I'm thinking of that which is truly a certainty, something that has some real teeth to it. You see, Abraham's faith was his strong confidence in the reliability of God's word. He believed what God had spoken, and so his faith is well-based. In addition, his hope was his strong confidence in the fulfillment of God's promises. And so he is looking forward with faith dovetailing with hope. And he's looking at the future and he's realizing that with him, this is not going to work, but with God, everything is possible. 
So you go from verse 18 to verse 21 where he has an assurance and a confidence and it leads us into verse 22 where he's actually placed his faith now in God, believing the promises of God and believing the provisions of God as well. And so we look back historically on a person known as Abraham and we say Abraham had a relationship with God because of the faith that he had in God. What about you and I? We're still looking forward to the culmination of our salvation, are we not? Right now, I see through a glass darkly. Have you heard that verse before? But one day, I'm going to see face to face, and that's going to change absolutely everything. Today in Christianity, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of preaching and a lot of teaching about, about really focusing on life here and now to the exclusion of looking at the future. It all becomes about me, and it all becomes about right now. What can I get out of this life? And I believe that that is, is really circumventing the blessings of hope that God wants his children to have. There is no way that I can sugarcoat it for you There is no way that I can put enough icing on this cake to cover the imperfections. And what I'm talking about is living in a sinful world. I fully believe that my best days lie ahead. But my best days are yet future to my life here on this earth. And so when I think of my certainty of my faith in Christ Jesus, and I think about what that means, it means that I'm looking forward to the promises that he made, just like he made promises to Abraham. Did Abraham live long enough to see these promises fulfilled? Absolutely. He began to see the miracles of God, and he began to see the provision of God, and his faith was not baseless. You and I, our faith is not baseless. We see what God is doing. We see what God is accomplishing in our life, and it brings an excitement to our souls. But I look forward to the future. I look forward to some awesomeness that's coming. I really do. And my hope is in the Lord. My my confidence is in the Lord, you see. I'm looking forward to an event called the rapture of the church. I look forward to that. I think that's going to be truly amazing. When I land, I won't even give it a second thought like air travel today. I'm excited about the millennial kingdom. I'm excited about seeing Jesus Christ on his rightful throne. I'm excited about seeing the world come and give him the adoration that he deserves. I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'm excited about the judgment seat of Christ. I am excited about heaven. And I can't even tell you what's going to be there. But all this I know is reason to be hopeful and to be excited about what God is doing. And it is not that I'm hopeful with no basis. Because for me as a Christian, I see the foundation. And if Noah could be given hope, if Abraham could be given hope, how much more so you and I today, looking back on what God has done, and taking his word and applying it as truth for the future. Do I have a reason to doubt God at all? The answer is no. I have no reason to doubt God. Everything that he says in his word comes true. That's all the introduction this morning. Let's go to our passage. (laughs) We're in Romans chapter 15. One thing I did realize this summer with the summer series is that you guys do pay attention. I don't know if you read what's in your bulletin, but you pay attention to what's on the cover. And people will say, hey, this wasn't the verse today. And we ended up switching up some things and the secretary was out on vacation and stuff didn't get changed and it was just kind of like, but I thought, nah, nobody pays attention to that, but I found differently. So I know you're all sitting there going, okay, there's that Romans 15. When are we gonna get to that? And you were starting to get nervous and well, you should be because we're gonna be here at least till, I don't know. All right. (laughs) 
we're in Romans chapter 15. And this is where, where Paul is, is writing. And, and Paul actually goes through and he gives us four quotes from the Old Testament here in chapter 15. So he's given Noah hope. He's given Abraham hope. And here he gives the Gentiles hope. And again, it goes backwards. It goes back to the Old Testament. In, in fact, the first one that you, you read there, and, and we see, for even Christ did not, and I'm, I'm there in verse 3, please himself, but as it's written, and it's an Old Testament reference, the reproaches of those who reproach you will fall on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so per, through the perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant to you to be of the same mind with one another, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore accept one another as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. He goes on and he begins to talk about the Gentiles. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision or the Jews on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. As it's written, there's where he starts it. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles. That's a reference there. If you want to take a note, write in your Bible. Second Samuel, for instance, 2250. And also Psalm 18, verse 49. David, in both of those places, vows to praise God among the Gentiles. Israel would be the instrument whereby God's saving work would come to the Gentiles. Next verse, verse 10. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. That's a reference there to Deuteronomy 32, where Moses is him that celebrates God's victory over Pharaoh. He is going to write there, Rejoice, O Gentiles, that are in his company with his people. Fascinating that he's picking out these parts of the scriptures that really applied to the Gentiles. The next one is Psalm 117 in verse 1. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. We come to our passage here. This is a reference to Paul citing Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah 11, 1, where he says, there shall come the root of Jesse and he who arises to rule over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles hope. You see, in the Old Testament, we have references to hope. We have indication that the Messiah would come. And not only would the Messiah come to, to seek and to save the Jews, he would come to seek and to save the Gentiles as well. And so there's a real reason for encouragement. Notice with me the next verse. And we'll camp here for a few minutes. It says, now may the God of hope. And there's an article before that word hope. It's the God of the hope. The God of the hope, the one who is prophesied about, none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who has come. He is the reason for my optimism. He's the reason for my confidence. If Christ had not yet come, if I'm living pre the incarnation of Christ, pre the work of Christ on the cross, I would look at that and I would say, I don't have the reason to be optimistic and having an air of certainty around me. But I do, because Jesus Christ has come. And what this produces, this certainty now, and knowing that the Messiah is here, and knowing that my faith in him brings about eternal life, it changes everything. And what spins off of this is vital for us to see. He says that the byproduct of that hope that we now have is joy. Notice there in verse 13 where he says joy. And not only does he say joy, but he says fill you with what? All joy. All joy. Joy produces a strength while we live out life today. There needs to be that joy in our life because there's going to be times when when times are truly difficult. But see, that's where our certainty, our confidence in God, the relationship with Jesus Christ produces a rejoicing even on days when it's difficult to rejoice. Abraham had that confidence. There's no question about that. And you and I can have confidence in Jesus Christ today and it does produce a chain reaction leading to joy. 
I like what Nehemiah said, Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. I don't have time to go there today. I wish I could. But Nehemiah talks all about the joy of the Lord being your strength. And when I think of this word joy, and I think about how much joy I have, I think of joy, and the terminology in the original language means to fill yourself up to the top with joy. Now, how many of you have ever gotten a fountain drink before? You know how those fountain drinks go. You push on the ice, and what happens? The ice comes out like, whoosh, and it's like, whoa. And, and, and then everybody's dumping the ice out, right? I mean, it's kind of like, oh, man, I, just, I want a little drink in my ice, you know? And you get, like, this much drink in a cup that's this big. And so you sit there, and you're mad because there's so much ice in your cup. And what do you do? You put it in there, and if it's a carbonated drink, you and you see how high it is. You give it a little bit more. You give it a little bit more, and you give it just enough so that it's completely full. I mean, it is full right to the brim. You can't get two more drops without having it go over the top. That is the description of joy that God's word is giving to you when he says that word, all joy. He means it's a full joy. It comes right to the top. It is all the joy you're ever going to need. And that joy is possible because of the certainty that you have about your relationship with God. Isn't that fantastic? You see, this is not a wishy-washy hope. This is a hope that's certifiable. It is foundational to who we are as followers of Christ, and it pays an enormous dividend. It gives to me all the joy I need as I live this life. Now, sometimes this life can be hard to live. Here's a verse of scripture from Habakkuk. You could pronounce this Habakkuk. You could pronounce it some other way. Maybe you know, uh, you know what it says in Italian or something. I don't know. But this is what he writes. He says, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food. I know what you're thinking, and we'll, we'll just go to Wegmans. That's the, you're missing the point. The, the, you're only eating what you're growing, okay? And if there's no food in your plot, there's probably none in your neighbor's either because the weather's probably been the same and that's what's contributed. He goes on and he says, the fields aren't producing fruit, food, and he says, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, that's never a good thing. There, though, there's no cattle, he says, in the stalls. That's a lot of time how life is, isn't it? Life kind of looks like that. You can make me all the promises in the world, but my hope is in the Lord. Yet, he says, yet, yet, he says, I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he's made my feet like hind's feet, like the feet of a deer. And he makes me to walk on the high places. There may not be any food on, there's no olives, the, there's nothing in the food plot, the, the animals have run off, and there's no cattle in the stalls. But he says, yet I'm going to still rejoice. And that's exactly what the disciple of Christ is able to do because our hope is in the Lord. And that certainty produces joy. It produces rejoicing. And life isn't always going to be wonderful. And, and if anyone makes you the promise and says, yeah, life is going to be wonderful, understand this, that this life right now is only the smallest portion of what you're going to do in yet your life. Your life hasn't even gotten going yet, and you're not going to live to 600. I can tell you that. You're not going to live to 600, but you've got a lot of life ahead of you. You've got all eternity as a child of Christ that lies before you. Now, he says that it's filled up to, to the top with joy, and he goes on, and he gives you another word there, and he says peace, too. He says, in peace, in believing. What a joy it is to be able to have a relationship with God where there's no contention, where you can go to bed at night and know that your soul is right with God. Is that a blessing? That is a blessing that can never be overlooked. What a joy it is in my life to know that I have a relationship, even as a sinner, 
I've been forgiven of my sins by our holy God, and I know he was going to welcome me into his presence someday, and my heart is at peace because of that. Oh, how the world today is in turmoil. I look at people on the news all the time, and I think these are people that have no peace. There's no peace. When I look at all of these things that God is going to do, he doesn't stop there. He tells us that it's almost like it's a cyclical thing. He says, so that you will, verse 13, you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when I see the joy in my life, despite all that empty cattle stalls and no food on the trees, when I see that joy, when I know that peace, it just makes my confidence in God grow all the more. Are you with me? My expectation for the future is not then something that may or may not. I can totally see where God is at work in my life today. I have no reason to doubt him for the future. The word there that means to abound, let's go back to the soda fountain, all right? You're at the soda fountain. You've got too much ice. You're going to put it right up to the top, and you're going back, and somebody from your family says, hey, and they start talking to you while you're filling. What happens? Oh, all of a sudden you look down, and it's all wet on your hand. All that good soda is all over your hand now. or sticky, and it's, oh, and you sit there, oh, wow, that abounded. And that's exactly the Greek terminology he uses here. For, for joy and for peace, he says it's filled to the top, but when it comes to certainty, he says it's overflowed. It's all on the floor. There's so much of it to go around. You don't even need it all. You see, God wants us to be people of hope, and he gives to us the hope that we need for every single day. If you're here this morning, you may be in your mind saying, I'd like to have that kind of hope. I don't know how many times I've talked to people about where they're going to spend their eternity, and the answer comes back, well, I hope I'll spend it in heaven. And the reason why there's that willy-nilly, wishy-washy type of hope is because our hope is built on something that's, that's not biblical. Our hope is oftentimes, before we place it in faith, in Christ alone, our hope oftentimes is on our good works or in our religious activity or something that we're trying to do or maybe just our philosophy of life. And it leaves us unsettled. We don't have that settled hope. We don't have that certainty. It's more of the kind of hope that, well, you know, I hope that I win the lottery. If you're here today and you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity, Understand that Christ died on the cross for you. And he wants nothing more than you to put your total faith in what Christ has done and in that alone. Not in your good works. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us. It means that we come to Christ and we don't come with our, our hands full of this world and what we've tried to do in this world. We come empty-handed before the Lord and we say that we acknowledge the fact that we're a sinner and when we're saved we're saved by the grace of God you see it's something that wasn't even merited on our part but it's God who's rich in that mercy who's given to us now eternal life because he's paid the debt of our sin that's what Jesus wants to do for each and every one of us if you're here today and you've placed your faith in Christ, I hope that the joy of the Lord is right to the top, that the peace is right there to the top, that the expectations for the future are sky high because that's what God wants in the hearts of all of his children. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the joy that we have, the blessings that we experience being in Christ. Father, how I pray that if there's anyone here today who's unsure of their eternal destination, that they would turn to Jesus and have those sins forgiven. Father, what a blessing that would be. Lord, thank you for being you and giving us to a position of, of joy and peace and hope. You've blessed us with so much. We give you praise for it all in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, even though Jesus died on the cross a long time ago, it's given to the church today to observe what we would understand to be the Lord's Supper. For Jesus, when he was with the disciples in the upper room, took of the elements, the bread and the cup. He says, this do in remembrance of me. By the time we come to Paul's teaching in Corinthians, he's received from the Lord the instruction to observe the Lord's Supper. And he tells us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And that's what this is about. There is no grace that is given to you by taking of these elements. You take of these elements because you are a person of faith, having received the gift of eternal life through faith in Christ Jesus. And it's important to know that because the Bible goes on to warn us. It says, therefore, whoever eats the bread, drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And so it's important for us to stop and look into our own life to determine if we have a relationship with the Savior, Jesus Christ. And then if we do, these elements take on such a different meaning, a special meaning. It may only be bread and it only may be grape juice, but it signifies the body and blood of Jesus Christ. If you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity and whether or not you belong to Christ, I would encourage you to hold off this time and not take these elements. But the Bible says this, in the next verse it says, but let a man examine himself. And after examining our own heart and life, he says, let him eat and drink making sure that we are a person of faith. I trust that as we have the opportunity to bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord, that we'll think back on what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and what it means to be a follower of his today and realize how much we've been blessed by his great sacrifice on the cross. Let's bow our heads together, shall we? Let's spend a moment in time and then our deacon, uh, John Stevens, is going to pray and ask the blessing on the bread that represents our Savior's body on the cross. Father, we're grateful for paying the penalty for our sin. We trust that what you did was for our good. And we trust and know that by believing in Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, we have new life. And Father, as we take of these elements, let us be reminded that you broke your body. Your body was broken for our sins. We're grateful for that, Lord. Let us remind ourselves, let's remember that you did this for us because you love us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.